Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the Winter Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Special Lecture. We're anticipating um, over 40 participants this afternoon. As you can see, we're conducting this presentation as a seminar, and we'll be recording um, the presentation as well. Uh, but please feel free, um, if you think of a question uh, during uh, Dr. Cortez's presentation, to use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen um, to pose a question to Dr. Cortez. I'd like to welcome Dr. Jamnia Cortez, who's joining us from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Dr. Cortez is assistant professor in the School of Nursing. Dr. Cortez received a Bachelor of Art in Biology from Williams College, a Bachelor and Master of Science in Nursing from Columbia University in New York City. She is a board certified family nurse practitioner. Dr. Cortez received her PhD in nursing from Columbia University and then completed a postdoctoral uh, training fellowship in cardiovascular epidemiology at the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health. As an assistant professor of nursing with advanced training in epidemiology, Dr. Cortez integrates her clinical and research knowledge in women's health across the lifespan, cardiovascular disease epidemiology, and health disparities. Her program of research focuses on understanding the sociocultural, environmental, behavioral, and biological factors that impact midlife women's health, the interface between reproductive aging and chronic disease, and the development of interventions to reduce health disparities among Latinas. This afternoon, Dr. Cortez will be sharing with us why menopause could matter to cardiovascular health inequities in midlife women. The floor is yours, Dr. Cortez. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. I'm glad to be with you today to discuss, as mentioned, cardiovascular health inequities in midlife women, why menopause matters. So, just a brief outline, I will. Um, present on why do I study cardiovascular disease in women, why menopause matters, an overview of menopause-related factors associated with cardiovascular disease, evidence of cardiovascular health inequities during this time period, sociocultural and psychosocial factors involved in disparities, interventions during the menopause transition, and some future steps. First, why am I focusing on cardiovascular disease? As you can see from this figure, cardiovascular disease, including coronary heart disease and hypertension, remains the leading cause of death among women across racial and ethnic groups. For the most part, cardiovascular disease develops seven to 10 years later in women than in men, and the mortality after the first myocardial infarction is higher in women. Uh, we see that cardiovascular uh, disease risk or CVD risk increases after menopause, possibly due to the declining levels of estrogen, but this increase occurs proportionally, meaning that women at high risk when they enter the menopause transition remain at high risk. Thus, early identification and interventions at this point are particularly important. And as you can see, this is an area of emerging importance. There was a recent American Heart Association statement on the menopause transition and cardiovascular disease risk. So this leads to the next question. Why does menopause matter? Menopause is defined as uh, the final menstrual period confirmed after one year without menses, and approximately 6,000 women reach menopause each year. Uh, that's over 2 million per year, 6,000 per day, over 2 million per year. And the average age is approximately 51 to 52. Um, with the average life expectancy now being about 81 in women, that means that there's about a 30 year span where an individual is living during post-menopause. Um, menopause can occur naturally or due to medical interventions such as the surgical removal of the ovaries, chemotherapy, 
Although all menstruating individuals will experience menopause, it is still a mystery. Uh, globally, nearly 50% of individuals surveyed in a recent campaign expressed that they do not feel prepared for menopause. And this was also a New York Times article recently um, on this phenomenon that a lot of people experience, most, many people are experiencing, but they're just <laughs> not prepared for um, in the general. In, in general. So similarly, uh, women express concerns uh, about the menopause transition in this qualitative descriptive study that I assisted with as a PhD student. So uh, it's important to know that even when you're a PhD student, all these different studies that you're working on and experiences that you're gaining do help you begin you know, that journey towards developing your program of research. And in this study, we conducted focus groups with women in two geographic locations in New York City. One was in Washington Heights, where we conducted focus group with Latinas. Uh, that's the focus group that I primarily, uh, those were the focus groups I prim primarily helped with. And the objective was to assess the experience um, of joint pain during the menopause transition or perimenopause. Um, and interestingly, what we saw is that the women in this focus group express, for example, I went through this menopause, I turned 50, and all of a sudden, everything changed. I stopped getting my period, I started getting all these aches in my knees and my wrists, and right here, my points to her hip. The, another participant said, I had a very good life, and all of a sudden, they prepare you for your roaring 20s, but they don't tell you jack about your 50s. And so it's, again, demonstrating just this, um, this mystery surrounding menopause and not really understanding or knowing what to expect. And this is a critical period in life. Um, so we need to try to do our best to minimize the confusion. So what exactly is the menopause transition? This figure illustrates the stages of reproductive aging. For today, I'll provide a quick overview on three main um, sections, which are the reproductive stage, the menopausal transition, and postmenopause. The reproductive period begins with first menarche and is a time for the most part, um, unless someone has underlying endocrine or other conditions, it is uh, for the most part regular menstrual cycles and predictable hormone patterns. The menopausal transition can begin four to 10 years before the final menstrual period. Uh, this is a time of irregular menstrual cycles, fluctuations in hormone, and as well as various symptoms, uh, the cardinal sign being hot flashes, uh, night sweats. Um, we also see a lot of sleep disturbances, depressive symptoms. And then we have, as I mentioned, postmenopause, which begins after a year of no menses, and the hormones begin to stabilize, but there's still this early postmenopause period that women are still experiencing symptoms and fluctuations in hormones. So the menopause transition is associated with many hormonal and metabolic changes. Here we begin to see greater declines of estrogen and an increase in follicle stimulating hormone and it's most uh, prominent two years prior to the final menstrual period and up to two years after the final menstrual period. Um, and then the, the hormone changes begin to plateau. During this time period, there's an increase in cardiometabolic risk factors like those listed here, in addition to psychosocial changes. And all of these have been related to cardiovascular disease. So this is why this is an important time of a lot of change. Therefore, it's an important time to implement interventions. And it's also because of this increase in these CVD risk factors that I tend to focus on this time period as well. Important factors related to cardiovascular disease during this time include age at final menstrual period. So studies have shown that younger age at final menstrual period is associated with an increase um, of cardiovascular events. Um, Average age, as I mentioned, is about 51, 52, but it can range from 42 to 65. And the earlier age as shown here um, might be a representation of shorter duration of estrogen exposure. So another uh, factor that sometimes we look at is reproductive period duration. Basically, 
timing age at final menstrual period minus age at menarche. Um, and that's more so because estrogen ha has cardioprotective effects. This is also another reason why um, bilateral oophorectomy or the surgical removal of the ovaries has been shown to increase liver profile, so another CVD risk. And we've also seen that vasomotor symptoms, which may have an underlying um, vascular component, are also related to an incident cardiovascular disease. Now, one of the things that I do not really focus on here is on hormone therapy, but I mean, if I'm talking about menopause, I have to mention something about hormone therapy. Um, we know that hormone therapy is not indicated for cardiovascular disease protection. And many of you have heard of the Women's Health Study because of the cardioprotective effects of estrogen. It was at one point thought, then let's give you know hormone therapy that will protect women from cardiovascular disease. However, um, that is not what was found. It was also due to the timing of when the estrogen was given. And so um, what we can say in terms of hormone therapy is that it is indicated to help relieve symptoms, um, such as vasomotor symptoms, which are important um, in terms of quality of life, but also, as I said, these CBD risk factors, and that the decision to start hormone therapy is individualized. And so the dose, the root, um, and the type of hormone therapy is, is part of a, converse, a larger conversation. What have been gaps in the menopause literature, particularly in relation to cardiovascular disease? Research has primarily focused on, on non-Hispanic, non-Latina white women. Um, there is a need for additional work using a socio-ecological framework and there is a need to identify multi-level risk and resiliency factors, and also the importance of a life course perspective, which now we're seeing accumulating research on a uh, life course perspective, meaning what occurred uh, uh, during early childhood, what has occurred during pregnancy, which is another piece of some of my investigations, and how that relates to cardiovascular risk during the menopause transition. This is a brief model. Um, I like to draw a lot. I just like to visualize things. And I use the, I adapted this using the NIMHD, National Institute of Minority Health Health Disparities Research Framework to identify further areas of consideration. So as you can see, there are multiple sociocultural, environmental, and behavioral, biological factors to consider. On the individual level, for instance, um, factors such as acculturation, stress, neighborhood walkability, which impact um, behaviors and uh, CVD risk factors, and which are also related then to the, are also related to the menopause experience. The next few slides, I will discuss uh, data from the study of women's health across the nation, which is a multi-site, multi-ethnic longitudinal study of the natural history of the menopause transition. And women were enrolled between 1996 and 1997 from the seven sites listed here. Each site recruited white women in addition to women from one other predetermined racial or ethnic group. Uh, women were eligible for SWAN if they were age 42 to 52, were pre or early perimenopausal, had an intact uterus and at least one ovary, and had menstrual bleeding in the past three months and no hormone therapy. At annual visits, information was collected on sociodemographics, medical history, menopause history, physical measures such as waist circumference, BMI, blood pressure, and blood draws for sex hormone levels and lipids. A total of 3,302 women were enrolled at baseline. And at follow-up visit 1213, um, several subclinical markers for cardiovascular disease were detected. One of them was um, intima media thickness, uh, which is measured as illustrated here by carotid ultrasound. Um, and so from this uh, image, you can measure the intima media thickness. You can also visualize whether there's plaque accumulating in the carotid artery. And I'll also discuss a few other measures, um, but I won't go into too much detail about them. Um, 
So on average in Swan at this time period when the carotid assessment was obtained, women were age 60 years of age. 50% um, were white, 31% black, 13 and 6% identified as Chinese and Latina respectively. 97% were postmenopausal. 47% had some college education. 40%, oh, 55% on this one. Yes, I was looking at a different visit at some point. 55% <laughs> um, had hypertension, 14% had diabetes. So in Swan at this uh, time period, uh, we noted differences in cardiovascular disease risk factor burden um, by race ethnicity. As shown here, Black and Latina women had significantly worse CVD risk factor profile, including smoking history, hypertension, diabetes, and the presence of multiple subclinical cardiovascular markers. So um, it was in addition to the carotid and intermediate thickness or the presence of plaque or arterial stiffness was another one. And this increased risk may be attributable to financial strain, education, neighborhood environment, and stress as I'll describe in the next few slides. In addition, uh, the more adverse CVD risk factor profile may be due to health behaviors and potential mechanisms involving inflammatory and neuroendocrine pathways. And so just briefly, two additional studies um, that kind of get to some of these factors that I was mentioning, the social, cultural, or psychosocial. So first, uh, this analysis in SWAN by Dr. Tane Lewis um, and colleagues examined the relationship between chronic exposure to everyday discrimination. And so this was uh, annual visits across five years. At each visit, individuals were asked about everyday discrimination. These, the reports were averaged. Um, and that was uh, the chronic, ex the chronic every exposure to discrimination. And then at the same at year five, the same follow-up visit, um, women underwent coronary artery calcification. And so in the sa sample of 181 uh, African-American women did find that discrimination was associated with higher coronary artery calcification. Uh, in the MS Heart or Miss Heart study, um, which enrolled participants around the same age period as those in Swan, Dr. Thurston and colleagues found that traumatic experience, and this was um, a cumulative scale. Um, it asked about childhood adversity, uh, sexual harassment, uh, accidents, illnesses, violence, and uh, they found that 60% of women reported a traumatic exposure uh, and that the traumatic, those who reported traumatic exposure and the more traumatic exposures, the greater number was associated with endothelial dysfunction, which is another subclinical measure for cardiovascular disease. Another recent analysis, and at the time this was in SWAN, it was part of a PhD student's dissertation. Again, now I'm look, thinking about earlier when I mentioned the environment and the importance of uh, the environment as well and what we're noticing. So this student found that particular matters, so neighborhoods where individuals live, and this was by Swan site, that those with higher particular matters um, had a faster progression of subclinical um, atherosclerosis during the menopause transition. So this is just to say there's a lot to explore and accumulating evidence in terms of underlying factors, sociocultural, psychosocial, environmental, that may worsen cardio, that may be um, involved in this association of this increased risk of cardiovascular disease during the menopause transition. And then also with inequities, because we do see how these contribute to inequities in terms of neighborhoods where individuals are, are living and the um, greater rates of trauma, exposure, and early childhood adversity among women of color. Um, and this is another illustration, uh, just another way of conceptualizing some of the evidence so far. And I wanted to also show, um, right now in this talk, I'm focusing on some of the, um, how these psychosocial factors, sociocultural factors, and even immigration policies we've seen 
are related to um, what's going on during the menopause transition and how that relates to cardiovascular disease. But on the other end of the spectrum, and this is for <laughs> another talk, is also how these are related to what we see during pregnancy and how these adverse, how they're related to adverse pregnancy outcomes as well. Um, and a, a lot of these is very similar pathways. It's just that we see it occurring um, at different time periods. So we discussed so far many risk factors, and I think it's also important to identify protective factors of cardiovascular disease during the menopause transition. And this is a recent analysis, the uh, abstract will be presented next week at the American Heart Association Conference, Happy Lifestyle. So in this one, we explored whether daily spirituality is associated with allostatic load trajectories among African-American women in Swan. And so allostatic load refers to the cumulative burden of chronic stress. So what we're actually, what's actually the wear and tear on the body after experiencing uh, this cumulative or chronic stress and life events. And we use uh, the markers listed here for our calculation. We summed, uh, we summed the number of markers that were at or above the 75th percentile at each SWAN visit. And then we conducted group-based trajectory modeling to um, identify, and we identified three trajectories. We identified women that were consistent, had consistently followed a consistently low allostatic load trajectory, moderate and high. Oh, and these are the percentages of how many. So there were about 21% that were in that high allostatic load group. And in our age adjusted models, we found that women who reported daily, and again, this, um, this analysis was specifically among African-American women, who reported daily comfort and spirituality were less likely to be in that higher allostatic load trajectory group. Um, suggesting this may be a protective factor, this may be buffering some of these um, negative effects on cardiovascular health. And so now thinking about, we have this emerging evidence on how uh, we have increase in cardio, we have evidence on the increase of CVD risk during the menopause transition. We understand the importance of behavior, of these sociocultural factors. So we, we probably have so many interventions that are you know, um, focused on this time period, but we don't. Um, even though we know that behavioral interventions have been shown to reduce CVD risk, there are a few focus on um, women when they're transitioning menopause. Uh, or premenopausal women and preparing them for the transition. One study that we, that one intervention was the uh, women on the move through activity and nutrition study. And this did find that um, even after four years, individuals who were in a lifestyle change intervention, which included physical activity and uh, nutrition intervention, they did find that they had lower um, weight after four years. However, this intervention and the few interventions that there are looking at women during the menopause transition do not frequently include women of color. And they're not always culturally tailored um, and they do not address some of these psychosocial factors that are important. So in order to fill some of these gaps, not all of them, because I can't, you know, one step at a time. <laughs> In order to fill some of these uh, gaps, I actually am um, like examining uh, pilot testing and intervention in my current K23. And we are testing the feasibility and initial efficacy of a nutrition, physical activity, and stress management intervention among Latinas during the menopause transition with the hope of reducing CVD risk, those listed here, um, and improving health behavior. Just briefly an overview of the plan. Uh, we have three visits. Uh, the intervention consists of 12 weekly sessions and then three monthly session, sessions, so it's a six month period. Uh, participants are randomized either to receive the intervention or they're in a waitlist control group. 
uh, participants are eligible if they're age, if they're Latinas, age 40 to 60, have variable menses, so that beginning of the menopause transition, or up to two years after the final menstrual period, which is considered early postmenopause, are not on hormone therapy and at least have at least one hormone intact. And so right now we're currently, we finished cohort. So I separated women into cohorts of 20. So our first cohort is now going to start their visit three. So 12 months after six months of being on their own um, data collection and cohort two is finishing the intervention and um, we'll have their six month data soon. For this study, we've recruited uh, participants across four counties in North Carolina, concentrating here. And even within this, even within this uh, range, initially we started Durham and Wake because those are the closest to the home base for UNC. We conduct data collection either at the UNC Biobehavioral Lab or uh, participants' homes. Uh, initially, we were also thinking about community organizations and churches but due to COVID, we had to minimize and those places weren't open at that time period. So it's been the lab. But I will just say, uh, uh, even within just focusing on what looks like the small circle here, uh, sometimes we're driving over an hour or an hour to get to a participant's home to collect data. So I just wanted to say that this is my first K23. I've always been interested and passionate about community engaged work. Uh, but it does take a lot of time <laughs> and a lot of effort, but, but it's wonderful to do. And so some of our recruitment strategies, we um, recruit from churches. We do have existing partnerships with um, some community-based organizations that serve the Latino community in North Carolina. We've recruited from community clinics. Um, we've gone to different, we've been invited and we've also gone to different health fairs, the internet and word of mouth. And briefly, um, the intervention, the health education component was adapted from an existing curriculum, um, Your Heart, Your Heart, Su Corazón, Su Vida, Your Heart, Your Life, which is a community health worker um, delivered intervention. Um, and this is found on the CDC in terms of, you know, a lot of the interventions that are for community health workers. But we modified it to include messaging about menopause and what to expect during the transition and the different increase in cardiovascular disease. Um, but as you can see, we distribute different and discuss different recipes that might be simple adjustments to things that maybe something already cultural that individuals serve. Um, we use different telenovelas, um, just comics and different ways of, of distributing information. Participants receive stretch bands, yoga mats. So the physical intervention could include Zumba, yoga, um, different learning how to stretch. And then we also have, like I mentioned, uh, stress management. So the stress management sessions, and it's roughly 45 minutes education, 45 minutes physical activity, and then 15 minutes of um, stress management. So that would include aromatherapy. Sometimes we talk about mindfulness, meditation. And then the last, the monthly sessions are more about problem solving process. What are barriers that you've encountered? Um, different scenarios, you know, someone, you know, you're out with family or you go to a family event and you know you're watching what you're eating or you're trying to eat more nutritious meals, but there's like food and people are, piling things onto your plate, what do you do? So just simple situations like that. Uh, briefly, we've so far enrolled 41 um, participants, a mean age 48, 55% completed a high school education or less. Uh, we've noted that 98% were born outside of the contiguous or mainline US, mostly from Mexico, about 50% Mexico, 30% um, South America. Uh, and then after that, it's from the Caribbean. Actually, Central America, South America, and then the Caribbean. Uh, we see that for CVD risk factors, uh, women are mainly overweight, have 
lower than recommended HDL, the recommendation um, being, you know, optimal 60 for women. Um, here they have about 46 and nearly 15% have diabetes. Interestingly, our preliminary findings of the baseline data show that in addition to traditional CBD risk factors like older age, smoking and lipids, perceived stress, everyday discrimination, and higher hair cortisol levels are related to greater arterial stiffness, which is this is carotid femoral pulse wave velocity or arterial stiffness, which is another subclinical measure of cardiovascular disease. Meanwhile, we've seen a higher resiliency and the way that this brief resiliency scale, um, what it measures is basically your ability to, to bounce back after um, you know, an, an event. Uh, and this has been associated with lower uh, arterial stiffness. And so what does this mean? What are next steps and recommendations? I'm trying to put it all together. <laughs> Uh, the menopause transition is a critical period which is associated with adverse, change, adverse changes in cardiovascular disease risk. Uh, there are inequities in midlife health, but there's also an underrepresentation of women of color in studies. We've seen that there are multiple social determinants of health, uh, linking reproductive and cardiovascular health disparities. There's this need to integrate uh, women's reproductive aging into studies. What I mean by that is that we do have several epidemiologic studies that are looking at the natural history of cardiovascular disease. But, in, but when we were, when a lot of the studies were designed, they didn't really collect too much information on reproductive aging. And so trying to think through more of that, um, we're starting to see more studies are including it as like an ancillary piece, so that's important. But then another important um, piece is identifying multi-level risk and protective factors for future interventions. So my, um, even for my K23, I know that the pilot of this intervention mostly targeted individual behavior and individual. There's some components in terms of, of interpersonal, but for the future, um, thinking through more of what are the multi-level um, factors and interventions for that. And then I mentioned earlier the NIMHD framework, but there's also National Institute of Aging has their framework as well for health disparities. And um, again, it's talking about this, demonstrating the importance of uh, the interplay of these different um, factors and domains and how they impact health, influence um, health across life. And that's all I have for today. I'm open to any questions, discussions. Thank um, you very much, Dr. Cortez. So I neglected to remember, you're now our second uh, special lecturer, but um, is, seeing that there are no questions yet in the Q&A um, field, if you, uh, uh, attendees, you may notice at the bottom, you can also click on the raise hand button and I can give you access to speak. I forgot about that option. So um, if there are any questions, I'll look out for a raised hand or anything in the question and answer box. Aha, there's one. Let me find that hand. There we go. All right, Charles, please ask your question. Yes, hi, Dr. Cortez, can you guys hear me? Yes. Great. Dr. Cortez, at this point, do you have any idea of the mechanisms that link the um, social determinants of health to some of the outcomes in women? Um, in other words, uh, does it seem to be related to um, the stress pathways like corticotrophin releasing hormone being increased and then the consequences of that? I know that your research maybe didn't look directly at that, but I was, I'm sure you're aware of some of the pathways. And I'd just like to be reminded of what the current state is there. Yeah, that is one of the things which um, the, the stress releasing pathway, the HPA access, um, and that's actually one of the reasons and we've seen that in terms of um, some of the measures for, that are included in allostatic load, but then also um, 
uh, some of the other studies, like like in even though I have, I was actually surprised, but pleasantly surprised that even in this small pilot study, we did see that with the hair cortisol as well. That it was, it was. Um, I also found that in these, we saw perceived stress and pre, and everyday discrimination related to cortisol, which is also which was related to the CBD risk factors. Um, so, and we also see that individuals who experience, like I said, like a lot of the trauma, uh, early childhood adversity, everyday discrimination, racism, these have all been related also, or are currently there are studies underway about how they not only relate to cardiovascular disease, but they are related to some of these menopausal factors that I mentioned in terms of earlier age at, menop at menopause, um, worse basal motor symptoms. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Charles for your question. Next we'll go to uh, Dr. Clark who has a question for you, Dr. Cortez. Hi, Dr. Cortez, thank you so much. I am wondering, um, and I realize this was not a focus of the study, but I'm wondering if there is intergenerational transmission of knowledge about menopause and how cultural knowledge or medical I that's that's a great question. So actually in the the earlier focus group that I mentioned as a PhD student, and we've also seen this in a few of the more of the qualitative work that I've seen. Um, in in the focus group, the Latinas that we that were there said that they did not, and even I informally asked participants, I asked about this, uh, that there was not a lot of information growing up relating to what goes on at menopause. It was just something that was not really discussed. Um, so that's one of the reasons that, in terms of of understanding what you know may occur or the changes that will happen and what you know what you might expect um yeah they really they said that that was one thing they didn't know about and then I'm not sure now I'm also thinking about intergenerational in terms of age at menopause as well which there is um in general you may experience it around the same time that your mother did so there have been some studies in terms of um either looking for markers or again, if it's depending on environment and how there is that intergenerational um, impact. Awesome. All right, so first we'll go to Denise who raised her hand, or no, excuse me. First we're going to go to a question in the chat and then we'll go to Denise who has her hand raised and then a couple of questions in the Q and A. So um, Judy Sherman asks, uh, what do you think accounts for hot flashes even at least 12 years after menopause? So it's, in so it's interesting. We've all, Swan has also done, and it's a lot, um, Rebecca Thurston's work in Swan has looked at these trajectories um, of menopause. So there are some people that they have called super flashers who will continue to have uh, vasomotor symptoms late, like exactly like several further along or consistently more than what is expected. And um, some of it can be um, these, this underlying vascular uh, difference in terms of the ability to regulate kind of like your temperature, um, but it is something that they're, they're still investigating, but that you have seen that there are individuals who will continue to experience it um, longer. <clears throat> okay, now we'll go to Denise, I think. Uh, let me ask her to unmute. You need to unmute Denise if you wanna speak. Mm, it doesn't seem to be working for me this time. I don't know why it's not working. Let me see here. Mm. 
I've given her permission to talk. <laughs> okay, well, maybe, um, well, just real quick, because Judy responded in the, in the chat. She said, I'm lucky not having them, and thank you for your answer. I have friends who still experience hot flashes. All right. Okay, so let's go to some of the, the questions in the question answer box uh, from Dr. Paul Macy. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for a great talk. Are there major geographical differences over the U.S. in CVD risk factors? How do these yeah, compare yeah. in magnitude with racial ethnic disparities? If this is, uh, or is this unknown? Well, there are, it also depends on which type of risk factor, but there are differences in terms of CVD outcomes and risk factors and geographic locations. And they do, I mean, um, we see higher um, stroke cases in the South, which happens, which mm, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of where else, but there are these differences that could also be due to the difference in distribution in terms of race ethnicity, but, it also, it also plays into, I mean, geographic locations also have their culture. So like we all, I, all right now that I've noted is in terms of differences. And I think that it's just multifactorial for why we have some of these differences. Um, we also see the differences in terms of, um, ethnic groups. So for example, we might see more hypertension among for Latinos sometimes, just like a lot of groups get lumped all into one category, but you might see um, more hypertension in Puerto Rican, like Puerto Rican and Dominican women in Swan, but you'll see more diabetes among Mexican women. So, so it, there's like different says there are geographical, there are differences by race ethnicity, but the reasoning I think is multifactorial. I'm not sure if that answers. And so it sounds like he, he asked another, he, 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 he made another statement, but it sounds like if I'm understanding correctly, these, um, the fact that it might be multifactorial would suggest that there are probably, um, based on geographic differences, um, some biological risk factors that might be driving this. Because like you pointed out, I mean, geographical differences might actually be related more to particular people living in particular areas. So um, he says, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Macy. Um, so next we have a, um, a question from our Dean, Dean Linshan. Uh, she says, Dr. Cortez, thank you for the important study, particularly for under-researched Latinas. My question, did you see differences between those as immigrant and those uh, that are not immigrants? As immigrants, what language difficulties and health literacy uh, related to risk of CVD during menopause period? So in my Pilot study, 98% were born outside of the US and spoke Spanish. So I couldn't tease out some of that, but in general, there have been um, studies looking at the differences and have shown that with longer duration in the US, um, it's kind of like, it depends on what you're looking at. <laughs> Again, it's tricky. Longer duration in the US and rural culturation in midlife, even, you know, is still related, is related to a worse cardiovascular disease risk factor profile. However, um, you can't ignore like in this study that only 39% of women have health insurance because only 39% of women are eligible for health insurance based on immigration status and how that also impacts uh, quality of life. And especially, um, social isolation and how social isolation um, 
also relates to some of these depressive symptoms and behaviors, health behaviors that lead to adverse cardiovascular disease risk. So it's, I think they're both important, but we actually see that with, with longer duration in the US, CVD risk is, is worse. So I just chatted with Denise. Maybe she just uh, thought, maybe her question has been answered and that's why, um, but we'll see. We'll see if she types back to me. Um, so um, I have a question that has more to do with uh, research participation and less your, your domain area of CBD um, and, and menopause. So, because it's interesting to me that in your work, right, in your pilot, in your, your pilot study, I mean, the, that, I mean, almost over 95% of your participants are Latinas or of some uh, non-US born, you know, um, uh, individual. And so, um, but a large proportion Latinas. So what is, I'm sure there's some literature on um, how it is that we could encourage more participation, what are the barriers of their participation, and what have we not done historically that we need to focus on improving for the future? Um, so it's actually, <laughs> actually just had a paper accepted in menopause. <laughs> about that because of whatever we've, we've been trying to do in the study, but there's definitely other, that one's more focused because it's this time period, but there's work in general about how to uh, try to recruit La Latinos and um, especially, um, and I, I think uh, one of some of the strategies that I think have been successful, and this has it's also been difficult now for this pilot study because it was, during COVID, so <laughs> it was like that other added piece to it. Uh, so I think it's helped <laughs> that I am Latina and speak Spanish and have been able to build some of these uh, contacts. I mean, you, I can't say that that's, of course there's still obstacles. One, I am not from North Carolina. I started at UNC in 2018. So still an outsider in that way. Uh, and I'm still like an academic. So that's <laughs> another layer of being an outsider. So I can't say that it was like, oh, because I'm Latin and I speak Spanish, the doors were wide open, but it helps because I've been able to communicate and try to present a more, um, and understand certain things about uh, culture more of the way that I present, um, you know, the, the study. But then also we have um, bilingual, like, our research, the research assistants on the study as well. And I think that's usually when we've seen and um, that individuals do prefer or not, they, they trust if they see individuals that speak the language. Um, also, if you show, you know, if you explain really well what the study is with the participation is you go out and you meet individuals as I mentioned from from community organizations it's important to partner with these community organizations that and and also not to go to the community organization and ask for something without offering things as well because we have a history of these things occurring so you for example um, I, you know, we talk about going to the health fair, providing health education workshop, providing help with like high school students applying to college, something that we can actually collaborate with community organizations. I think that that's important. Um, using the materials uh, that you're distributing, making sure that, you know, we, as I said, the research assistants are um, bilingual, but also you want, you can run them by like community advisory boards and individuals that are from the community that can tell you whether or not what you're saying makes sense. A lot of our participants also like that we call them with their results. Um, we, um, so we provide that um, level of education for them with their results. And then also, since they don't have health insurance, a lot of them, we provide information on where they can go um, that would be either free clinics or clinics that offer 
a, a pay scale to help. I think I think a lot of that also, and then being flexible with scheduling, with transportation, being really flexible. So those are all great reminders. I know we hear those things, but I, I think it's really important to remember because I, I have to imagine um, just even in my own work, you know, um, trying to figure out the budget for some of that stuff sometimes can be tricky depending on who the funder is and what is an allowable cost and what's not an allowable cost. And so really trying to educate funders on, you know, doing work with immigrant and um, underrepresented minority groups sometimes requires um, a different investment, not necessarily a larger one, sometimes just different in terms of how they define what is an allowable cost and what's not an allowable cost. Anyway, that is the end of our special winter special lecture. Um, here you have in front of you, if you have any questions that you want to shout out to Dr. Cortez, her email is right here, um, yicortez at email.unc.edu, or you can even tweet with her at ijomnia, jomnia with a Y. All right, um, until the summer when we have our next special lecture, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cortez, and I wish you all a, a pleasant day. Bye-bye.